Greetings and welcome to Conversations with Tony Mobley. Welcome Z98.1FM.com, our audience in Cincinnati. And also we can be heard on TuneIn Radio app and internet radio everywhere. On Conversations with Tony Mobley today, I am talking to Dave Trotman, educator, director, producer, radio and television, and even more. And we're going to find out about that more in just a few minutes. Thank you, sir, for being with me today. And I really appreciate it. This is episode 65 of Conversation with Tony Mobley. Thanks to everyone for being a part of this journey. Again, welcome Z98.1 FM.com our radio and our audience in Cincinnati, Ohio, and can be heard on TuneIn Radio app and internet radio. Real conversation with real people. Why are we here? We're here because life has provided me the opportunity to have real conversations with real people. Last week, we had a rebroadcast of my conversation with Nancy Huslich. We hope to have Nancy back with us soon. I want to thank the team behind Conversation with Tony Mobley for all your hard work. All right, audience, I need your help. I need your help. I need you to go to my website, conversationwithtonymobley.com and participate in the Mukana chat. Why do, on earth do I want you to participate in the Mukana chat? Well, you can ask Dave questions tonight and you can get those questions voted up and down. And so we want to make sure that those questions get asked and answered and voting is the best way to get that done. So we hope that you will go to Conversation with Tony Mobley, register and ask your question. Thank you so much. If you like this and past conversations, we ask that you like and subscribe, set that bell to all notifications, and be reminded of upcoming conversations. So now, here we are with the first question for Mr. Dave Trotman. Who is Dave Trotman? Uh, Dave Trotman is a dad, a husband, a servant of the community, and a fellow who's endlessly curious about the uh, effects of media on people's behavior. That's fantastic. So I'm going to start with one of Tony Mobley's uh, often asked questions. What lessons have you learned from your parents that you're currently using today? Oh, that's pretty easy, actually. Uh, there are two main themes in our family. One was uh, challenge authority, and we were taught that even at the t dinner table. Um, we got to challenge our parents' ideas, and they challenged ours, and uh, it was a good exchange with a, a large family. Uh, the second thing was service to community. Uh, he was a forever reminding us that we pay taxes to get people to do stuff for us, but we also have to do stuff for them and for others and our neighbors. So he was always a community leader and uh, almost every member of my family has at one point been a community leader or is now. And uh, we're just naturally inclined to give back. Okay, let's talk about your early childhood in Canada. Sure, yeah. Middle-class white guy living in a neighborhood full of kids. You could leave home in the morning and be gone all day, nobody missed you. They knew you were safe with everybody else and everybody knew everybody and all the moms would get together and play bridge or sit in the backyard and have tea. And it was uh, probably quite idyllic in that we could go out and have our adventures in the woodlands and all that and come home all scratched up and uh, have our bath and dinner and uh, go to sleep. So there was that. And I've been through all the basic school. So um, we had the great advantage of having a, a curriculum there that spread our minds and challenged us and uh, was all, always flexible when I was challenging it. So that was my childhood. Okay. okay. Let me ask you this. So you, you talked about uh, the education system being mm -hmm. um, varied. 
And could you talk a little bit more about that? Because we, we in the United States are, I think, consumed with um, a system that is uh, delivered that has worked. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm one of those people who leans toward integrating project-based learning along with um, traditional education. I think that mm -hmm. that 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 project-based learning informs the traditional education and and helps you know uh, practical use of the traditional education. So I was wondering yeah. if you could share some of your experiences with that. Well, um, there's two parts to that that I'm going to give you an answer for because when it comes to my education, um, it was diversified. It wasn't just the basics. And so we were introduced to a lot of things and we were taken to see a lot of places and we were um, invited to to investigate things. So you were allowed to get up out of your chair and go to the library and get a book and not be supervised. It wasn't a sort of class route to the library. And I, in fact, in, when I was in grade four, our classroom was the library. So it was oh, so wow. crammed with kids. Um, so uh, our school system up here has a, a curriculum that actually is uh, used actually in many other places in the world. It's uh, used extensively in Korea. Uh, Finland's education system is based on the Alberta curriculum and a number of other Alberta uh, provinces in Canada use the Alberta curriculum. So it was developed by really smart people and uh, it's still today very effective. Um, but it, it allows people when they, you know, enter university and get challenged to think for themselves that, in fact, a lot of Albertans get to university and go right through and don't have many problems because they've learned in early life how to think for themselves. And, and um, they call it today critical thinking, but it was just a case of, you know, you had to stop and explain why you knew something, not just regurgitate it. Um, later, when I was working at the university as the uh, television producer for the Faculty of Education, I got to meet uh, Professor Sylvia Chard, who uh, proposed a whole new way of doing projects. And it was a bottom up approach rather than uh, coming to school and the teacher saying we're going to choose from this selection of projects and kids will pick one and gather in groups and do project. Uh, she would start with a classroom asking kids, what do you already know? And then they would have a long time discussion over weeks of what each child knows, what it is they're curious about, what would they like to investigate? And then a consensus usually forms around all the kids. They hear what other kids are interested in. And then they say, we'd all like to know about that. And that becomes the project they work on for the entire year, the whole class. And it's wow. guided by the teachers. And everything they do has a curriculum element. There's math involved. There's writing. There's drawing. There's measuring. There's interviewing. Uh, there are field trips to explore. And all of it is in service of the kids driving the process and the teachers facilitating it. It's called the project approach. And uh, Duke University has a cool uh, school called the Duke School and the Duke Institute, which is uh, continuing that program because of course, Sylvia has uh, long been retired now. And uh, she and I got to work together on, where have I got them? Where have I, here they are. She and I worked on the project approach at the U of A. I shot uh, six videos, which were examples of what they were doing in the school that we had in Edmonton. And uh, she wrote a three phase practical course for teachers. That's what it says there. And um, it's in three volumes. I got all three of them here. Uh, the only reason I have these is that's going to be the subject of my, my uh, education hour on Saturday. But the project approach intrigued me. It was a whole new way of doing things. And you've never lived until you've seen parents visit the school. Uh, you know, the, they're invited to come one day. And the kids are all dressed in smocks and they greet you at the door and they take you into the waiting area and then they hand you a form and a clipboard and you have to fill out the form and they wrote the form and then they take you one at a time to registration and then from there uh, you're invited to go in and lie down on their x-ray machine and have an x-ray done and the technician there of course can't do an x-ray so they have a black piece of paper with a chalk and they draw your lungs and then you take those with you and then you sit in another room with another kid who is the radiologist and he's going to tell you what's what's in your lungs and what they can probably do about it. And then they leave you with a card. Now, mm -hmm. when you see uh, kids in grade two running a x-ray clinic 
because that's what they investigated that year. At the end of the year, they show the parents what they've learned. And the look on the teacher's faces when they lie down on the floor underneath their block built machine that's all cardboard and blocks and they fake a, an x-ray for you and you've got to suppress giggles but you, they hand you an x-ray and then you take it to a radio and they have the whole process figured out and then you're invited to have coffee in the in the other room the main classroom I, I mean when i saw stuff like that and when i saw kids learning about plumbing uh they just were curious when you flush the toilet, where does it go? And they just wanted the answers. So that became the year's project for that class. And they had plumbers in to show you how the pipes fit together. And then they would go down the basement of the school and look up at the plumbing and point out where things were. And then they went to the water plant and learned where all the water comes out of the river, what they do with it and where it goes. And they drew all the pictures, they did measurements, they interviewed people. And when it was all said and done, all these classes are fearless. They're, they're not afraid of the world. They're ready and they're engaged and everything is an adventure for them. And one pa last part before I finish the project approach, many of the kids in my, my son's class, uh, my son attended the school, of course, because you know I saw this and I had to have my kid in the program. <laughs> and my, right. kid, uh, my young man got uh, five years uh, of this project approach and then went to regular school, real school, he called it. Um, uh, the kids had a birthday party for one of the kids and they got all invited to someone's house for this and they had a magician and it was fun and the, everybody's sitting down and the, kid, the kids are really excited and they watch this magician do these tricks and about halfway through a hand goes up and of course the magician is going to say what's your question this is show us how you did that and he goes well it's it's magic uh, I, i'm not going to show you how i did this this is magic you just and all the kids were, oh, I don't know, you should answer his question. He's asking a good question. And all the kids were rebelling <laughs> and lost control of the audience because this is not what you're supposed to be able, I should be able to ask you a question and you should be able to answer us. So these kids just made it really hard on this magician who eventually shortened the show and got out of there as quick as possible. It's like the clown who gets his you know wig ripped off. Uh, right. <laughs> it was right. quite an exchange. And when the parents came to pick up the kids, the the parents learned from the kids. They were very upset with the magician. <laughs> we all going, wow. you didn't like the magician? And then we heard about what happened. And then they went, oh, he wouldn't answer your questions. Okay, all right. That's what that school did, though. Now, my that's, son is a rocket fantastic. scientist now, and uh, I credit the school with making him fearless. And he's out there doing a brand new thing for the world. So. Okay. Is, is there a Canadian space agency? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we invented the Canada arm, the, uh, that's the plucking arm that's on the space station and the shuttles, the thing that launches the satellites and pokes them into space. That's a Canadian thing. Uh, we also that's were fun. the first to put up a domestic satellite uh, on the whole planet. So, yeah. Up until then, they were all military satellites. But, uh, yeah, Canada had uh, ANIC-1 and ANIC-2 and 3, and then we had another set I'm going to forget the name of the second round, but uh, yeah, these, these satellites were the first to allow us to broadcast television across the whole country and in the north. The north is always a problem for Canada because it's so sparse, very few people, very little infrastructure. And so we do everything, you know, by air, including delivering food. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for sharing that. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, so what is it like to be one of seven children like mm. me? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm four of seven. Um, I'm the middleest. I have uh, two brothers and sisters above me. Uh, no, two sisters, one brother, sorry. And then two sisters, one brother below me. So it's kind of evens up three guys, four girls. Uh, my youngest brother is no longer with us. Uh, he, well, he had CP, uh, cerebral palsy. And uh, he lived till he was 35, quite independently. There's nothing wrong with what his brain could do. It's just his body gave him trouble. So he ended up uh, dying of a seizure. But I have all the other siblings with me, and we're all getting extremely old and gray. And uh, we're spread across two or three provinces now. And um, we get along just fine. Both parents are now gone, of course, because that's what happens. Uh, being right. the middleist uh, meant that I had to tread carefully, I guess. Um, not eggshell tiptoeing, but just making sure that I wasn't in the triangle of an argument. If an older person or a younger were arguing, they'd want me to get involved or uh, take a side or do something. And I got real good at 
just being able to say, well, both sides have a case and that sort of thing. And, and of course, challenging authority being one of our themes, uh, I had no authority. So that was great because if I had no authority, <laughs> they couldn't really say, well, your, your opinion matters. So when my opinion didn't matter that much, uh, then I was able to just back away from the situation or slip into the shadows and, and nobody notices I'm there. In fact, my wife asked my mom, what would you remember about, you know, what Dave was like as a young man? And she was going, well, he was, I, I didn't notice him very much. <laughs> so even my mother didn't really notice if I was at the dinner table or playing in the living room or out on my bike. She didn't really, she had more things to be concerned about, but yeah, I didn't make a stink and, uh, it's, it's, it was a great way to be um, balanced out. Later in life, I've been in leadership roles and a lot of those skills have come into play. That's very cool. Yeah, I, I, I happen to be- um, Yeah, you're a one. First yeah. born. And, and, and we were talking earlier in the show, uh, before the show about, um, about the test that, that yeah. so share the test that uh, information yeah. you shared with me about the test. Well, this might work for a lot of people if they have a sister or brother who is the first. Um, and then you go to a family gathering and uh, people are just having a fun time. They're talking to the spouses or the uh, cousins and all that stuff. And if somebody declares something and the eldest says something about that it has a different opinion or or wants to get more information about that usually when they start speaking everyone stops and this has proven out in my wife's family and it's proven out in my family so it just was a, a matter of the imprint that happens to a child who's born into a, a large family and i've met as many as 11 or 12 in a family when the eldest speaks the rest just fall silent and make their position known later and uh that's just something that that i passed on to you earlier is that when i heard you were a one i said well next time you're together with your family give that a try just start talking about something and see if the whole room goes quiet and then you know your wife or other people you know can verify it for you yeah I, i'm not sure that it applies to me but i will give it a try and the reason why i say it, uh i am i'm very soft-spoken um and i i don't operate I really don't operate as a, an oldest child. Mm. And so I, I, I'm wondering if that is going to apply, but I will, I will give it a shot. I will do the test. Mm -hmm. And uh, we meet every, every Sunday evening at 7 PM oh, sharp well, there you go. and uh, on zoom. And we're all, well, I was going to say that we're all over the country. We're no longer all over the country, all in the Southeast mm -hmm. of the United States now. So oh, good. Um, all right. So that's, well, that's it's a little cool. different on Zoom, of course, because there's formality in Zoom. There's one on one formality. You're you're one with many, but not in a crowded room with a lot of noise. So it, it might not work the same way over Zoom. I haven't tested it there <laughs> because we don't yeah, do we, do, we normally things. we normally try to get together at least once once a year. Um, oh, yeah. We were yeah. doing that prior to the pandemic. Since the pandemic, right. we haven't actually gotten together. We're looking same forward here. to. Yes. We're looking I haven't seen to... my sisters in three yeah. years, so we did a trip just three months ago to go and see everybody. So okay, I call it the girls' tour. Uh, <laughs> I travel through BC and and take a trip through all those mountains, and I spend three or four days traveling from city to city, and uh, spend a day or a day and a half with uh, with each of them, and we all get caught up and and know each other's lives, and have arguments that, too. Yeah, yeah. That's that's fantastic. Uh, the next question is, um, what did you do um, to get into radio? Um, that's interesting. Um, I think I got to go to a radio station sometime when I was younger. And I think just seeing a guy in a room behind glass you know, talking a little bit and then playing a song and then starting to shuffle papers and do the thing. And I thought, that's interesting. Hmm. So later I, I became a sort of filmmaker in my teens uh, because I had watched, um, I rode my bike uh, in the neighborhood. We had a drive-in movie not far away. And one night I was riding around on my bike and I was, all my friends had gone to do something else or were having dinner. 
And I went to this movie theater to watch the guy change reels. It was a very hot day and he had the back door of the projection booth open. And I just sat there on my bike and watched him do three or four reels. And the magic of what was happening suddenly was revealed to me, this, this man behind the curtain thing. And then when I was getting older, my voice changed and people were always saying, Dave, you got a great voice, you know, you sound good on the radio. And I kind of thought, yeah, I should try that out. So I signed up for college radio. Uh, I had a program for about two years. Um, there were two subjects I did. Thursday night was folk music and Sunday afternoon was electronic music, which was somewhat mm. brand new at the time. And I had quite a collection. And so I would bring not only mine, but what the radio station had and um, play this stuff and explain it and talk about how it was constructed and that sort of stuff. And the folk music was, you know, just a sort of study music that people on campus could use as background. And I played stuff that wouldn't annoy you and wouldn't interrupt you. It was never uh, too strong. And it also had a lot of themes. Some days it was violin, uh, how folk musicians include violin. Another day would be banjo. Another day would be piano. So I, I picked sort of themes through my thing. And the station manager thought, you know, I, I did a pretty good job and he wanted to keep me around, but it was volunteer. So when I went to train uh, in the Institute here, uh, the radio and television program, I went in thinking I'm going to come out an FM announcer and that was going to be what I do. Uh, unfortunately, I developed a lung condition in which my lungs collapsed. And uh, this mm. happened actually virtually at the start of school in the second term uh, in the shower. My lungs collapsed and I had to be rushed to hospital and re resuscitated and all that. And uh, so I spent a long time in a hospital bed. And then when I got back to school, I didn't have the energy to do radio for a six hour shift or a four hour shift. It, it just wasn't in me energy wise. So then I switched to, you know, what does television offer? And that's when I sort of turned the corner and said, radio's cool and groovy. And today, totally different. Uh, then I went into video and, and continued following on from film. It made it easy for me to get into television. So that's, that's our next question. So mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about working in television. Well, that was kind of odd because the real impetus to going to school was when I was sort of offering my services to the community access channel. You guys call them community access. We mm -hmm. have a mandate in Canada from the CRTC, the people who govern broadcasting, uh, both radio, TV and, and streaming, uh, to set aside a channel on the main band, the one of the first 13, uh, which would be available to people locally to be able to put their own programming and compete with whatever broadcast is in the city. Our, our city had five TV channels already, and this channel competed with them, but it's also a balance against the cable channel bringing in American channels, ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, and a, and a few others. So uh, this mandate meant that every cable company that operated in any city by their license had to have this channel, and it meant they had to have some staff, and those staff were hired to coordinate anybody who wanted to come in and make a show. So I showed up at the door of this place, and they were looking for volunteers to cover uh, local junior hockey games. Now they had a mobile truck and a couple of cameras and a couple of good guys. And I started working with these two guys uh, and, and he and I, uh, we, we were two cameras on a, on a crew and we were so compatible. We understood what we were shooting and we complimented each other. The director almost didn't have to call the show because we got him the next shot every single time. We knew what was happening on the ice. We knew what the game was about. And he just had to sit back in the truck and hit A, B, A, B all, down, all night long. So from that, uh, the, the station manager of the, of the place got me in his office and he said, you know, I could offer you a job here, but you don't have your ticket. So if you go to the Institute and get your uh, two-year ticket, uh, you come t back and talk to me and you'll have a job. And I thought, that's a great start to my life. Okay. So I got enrolled in this thing. It was not hard to get enrolled because I had already done some radio. I'd already done some research in film and all that. And my little application looked really good to them. Uh, they only allowed 12 people in the course each term. And uh, I got together with 11 other people who turned out to be really something. I finished that course and I went back to that station and he said, well, okay, you start on Monday and here's your job. 
And my job was to coordinate other people who wanted to learn how to make TV. And that was wow. very interesting because a community group like uh, uh, some of my favorites were the Caribbeans, the Filipinos, and uh, the Germans. Uh, I have a German, well, an Austrian background, which the Austrians don't like to think of themselves as German. Anyway, um, I got given four or five of these groups to to take care of, and I had to show them how to do audio. I had to show them how to do lighting, where a microphone goes, how a lapel mic fits, and how to get good camera work out of them. And we cover all kinds of events, and they had access to people in the community they could bring in for interviews. They would do a news thing segment. They would do a cultural segment if it was. I, I had the East Indian group who are still operating actually today. And uh, that was lovely because they always fed me. Uh, the Caribbeans <laughs> would never show up on time and you never did show up on time, but we did this all to tape, right? So the evening program was a series of playbacks from that day and the earlier in the week. And then uh, my Thursday nights were spent editing all this stuff. Uh, and I would work through the night and then we had a live morning show we did for the community generally, like it was us as a staff doing a, a one or two hour show with our own focus on the city and things that the other community league, uh, community groups wouldn't do. So they would talk about their community and exclusively their news and all that stuff. And then we would come in and do the general stuff. And some of that was fun. Uh, then they gave me freedom to produce my own shows in my spare time. <laughs> uh, and. And I started doing these investigations in video where I would produce a, um, um, well, they're called interstitials. And they're little bits that you play while you wait for the clock to get to the top of the hour. So if you have a show that's running four minutes late, the playback operator pulls out one of these things, puts it in the machine, cues it up. And then when the show goes to credits, he brings this thing up afterwards. And then there's a station break at the top of the hour and the next show starts. And I became pretty good at making these things and making the little interesting episodes like a trip on the train and uh, what happens, you know, who walks around the university and what does that look like and uh, neon lights all over the city uh, put to music and that sort of stuff. And I did one in which uh, I'd been doing a festival outside this major building downtown. It, it had about 20,000 people live, uh, working in it. And uh, at four o'clock every day, the doors would open and people would stream out because they're finished. And that stream would last for a half an hour because the door would never close. And that's what I noticed sitting there watching it. How, how long will it take before the doors close? And it was like 30 minutes. So I asked the uh, producer of the festival that day, could I break a camera out from the truck and just park it here at about 4.15 and just record whatever's happening right at these doors? And uh, he said, sure, we won't be doing anything till six. As long as it's back into the unit, that's great. I parked a tripod, a camera, and then, and then I just stood there. It was rolling and it was framed. And I just stood there looking around and people came out of the building. They didn't notice me. They kept on walking. And, and I had this stream coming at the camera for this long period of time. And mm. I figured you could cut that off anytime. So I made a little five minute thing out of it and uh, set it to a little bit of jazz music and it drove people crazy. They would <laughs> get this thing on and they'd stare at it and they go, what's going on? What? Well, what's the point of this? There's no story. There, it was like content that was empty. It was nothing. Mm. And it lasted this long time. Well, my playback operator at the staff meeting the next morning would slap down a big pile of papers. These are all the calls we got last night about Dave's little thing there. And, <laughs> like this. and my <laughs> boss was really intrigued. He kind of went, we don't get calls. <laughs> Nobody calls about our shows. Hardly anybody watches them. Why would anybody be upset by this? And that started me on the road to saying, what is going on here? What is triggering mm. people? They have an expectation of what's going to be on TV. A thing comes up and then they get so upset about it. They're going to find the phone number and call it and launch a complaint. I hate this thing. Don't play it anymore. This sort of stuff. And I thought, hmm, something really important is going on here. I remember from my training in radio and television, we learned about Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan is a great Canadian. He's not, not with us anymore. But he postulated a whole lot of things about how the world was changing. And he coined the phrase, the global village. And that at some point in the future, communication be so connected that we would all be living in a global-sized village and we would be each in each other's business. 
Uh, that was his complaint about it. But his idea that uh, accelerating our technology to the point where communication is ubiquitous, uh, that we will actually meet people from other parts of this country that we never meet in person, and that we develop relationships with them over a distance, and that we do these things uh, just quite naturally. Uh, but he postulated this in 1968. Wow. So well before the internet, he was talking about the internet. And well before these kind of conversations, this one-on-one -on -one thing we're doing over a distance, you're in North, what, North Carolina you're in? And I'm, I'm, I'm in Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia, sorry. Mm -hmm. And I'm up here in Edmonton, Alberta. Nobody's, you know, they don't know us except for Wayne Gratzky, right? So we have this communication and we have a, build, a possibility of building a culture through these portals we have. And uh, this is changing our brains. And our expectations about what life is about are shifting. We're expecting on instant and constant connectedness, not just connectedness with other people, but with services and systems and our bank. I mean, it's a calamity when the internet goes down. You can't get your money out of an ATM. You can't pay for your gas. You, you can't travel long distance and know you're going to arrive on time. It's it's so connected now that it's it's a whole different thing than when I first ran this thing in 1978. But since then, I've done many, many other uh, videos where it explores our perceptions of who we are and what we do. And this is what Marshall McLuhan was doing as well. He was trying to explore the idea that if, if you apply uh, what he used as literary criticism to what we're doing every day, you, it reveals all kinds of layers. And his first book was about the comic Dagwood, have you ever seen the comic Dagwood? Oh, yes. Uh, hard beaten husband who has yes, sir. all that stuff. So he mm -hmm. did a whole book on what that means, what that's about, why it's the American man and he's unique from the European man and the Asian man and, and the job and the nature of our corporate world and how it's affected family and time and even the dog gets involved. So he did that. And then he was um, he was at a uh, uh, university in Louisiana and I can't remember it. And then he went to Cambridge and got his PhD. And then he started touring around and telling people, you know, what he understood. He got so famous that, you know, he was on NBC News and documentaries were made about him. And he did a thing with Buckminster Fuller where he spoke for five minutes and then Fuller got up and spoke for five. And then he got up and spoke for another five and Fuller got up and spoke for another five. And the audience was totally enraptured because these are two different philosophies of the world and they're, they're changing places like this. Well, I got quite excited about it. And I went back to my instructor who taught me about this in the early days. And I said, I finally understand what McLuhan was talking about. I thought I was crazy when I read it, but now I've seen it in action and I'm really interested. And he and I developed quite a, a relationship and I used to have lunch with him three or four times a year, uh, even after, you know, we both of us are very old. Amazing, amazing. Um, you know, one of the things that occurred to me is that that this, this this whole uh, segment that you just talked about is really about engagement and and the fact that um, the initial uh, uh, what did you call it the strip that you started or skip um, of the people coming out of the um, sure a little clip the space there, yeah. mm -hmm. it it all of it stems from making people even if they didn't like it. It forced them to engage. Mm. And it seems as if this whole thing that we're experiencing now is about engagement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, you, you think about it, you know, the Facebook and, and, and uh, um, uh, the uh, Instagram, all and, the platforms, and, and yeah. all, of, all oh. the platforms, yeah. you know, people are sharing things that they really, in some instances, should not share. You know, it should be, it should be, sure. it, should, yeah. it should be stuff that they keep to themselves, yeah. but it's, 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 we, we live in a time where there is an engagement and it can be negative or positive, but there's mm -hmm. a need and desire to or have connection. some type of connection. Yes. Yes. Uh, I en ended up getting a, uh, I call him my digital pen pal. Uh, the two of us were subscribers to a magazine and, and uh, an e-zine um, about computers. And uh, he was there, and he was from Quebec in Canada, which is quite far away from where I am. And their culture is very different than Western Canada. 
And uh, I noticed this guy, and I thought he worked for the government or something. So I just engaged and you know send him an email and comment on what he said in the the comment part of this easing. And he came back and he was interested in what I had to say. And the two of us got to get to know each other over the years. And and it was 30 years of being a, an email correspondent with this fellow. And occasionally I'd get pictures of what his life is like and things that he's changing. Uh, it, attitudes he had that I thought were really odd. And uh, he would comment on things that are going on in my politics up here and ask me, you know, is it really like that? Is that really what's going on? And so I'd explain my world to him and he'd explain his to me. And we got really good. And never once in our whole lives did we actually meet in person. Now, he died during mm. the pandemic, actually. Early in the pandemic, he got sick and he died. And I've had to mourn a guy I've never met. Hmm. We yeah, don't do that. I, you know, you try and explain this to someone from 1929, and they're going to go, you never met the guy, and you're real sad that he died. Okay, yeah, sure. Talk to me later. I, I, that, it's, it's, it's interesting that you say that. I, I, I had an opportunity to engage with a young man, uh, uh, a, a, a friend. I made a mm -hmm. friend in office hours. His name was Mike Andrews. Oh. And uh, Dave... When I first, and I'll, I'll share with the audience, particularly those who are on the radio, what Office Hours is. But um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was, um, I had an opportunity to participate in Office Hours. And I am not the person that you're looking at now with, you know, the micro, the PR40 microphone and sure. pretty good video and all of that. I was horrendous, Dave. Mm -hmm. I mean, awful. Oh, I've been there and I've seen that. I and, train, and so I trained lots I, of people in video conferencing. So yeah, I know what yeah, you were Yeah. About. So I I I would I, I don't know why I had the nerve or even the audacity to want to you try to engage with those professionals on office hours, but I but did. But it's so alluring, isn't it? To what they're talking and, about. And, it's so interesting. Yes. And and the, the thing that happened was they they allowed me to play and learn and experience and mm -hmm. grow and be nurtured but there was one individual there were a lot of individuals in office hours that were extremely helpful mm -hmm. but there was one particular individual his name was mike andrews educator um mm -hmm. based in the chicago area and i would and and i'll be transparent um I did not, after I got to know what the community was about and how professional they were, I sort of pulled back. And the reason why I pulled back, and, and this is me being transparent, mm -hmm. as a Black man who didn't look good, who didn't measure up, I wanted to run away and not just, you know, just, just listen. Yeah. And 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 not be, happy not, with be not, getting involved. not be on camera. I'm not worthy. And, I'm not worthy. <laughs> yes. And and so I, you know, I was going through all of this and and I would and Mike would constantly call mm -hmm. me, text me, engage with me. Yeah. I need you to continue to participate. You have something yeah. to say. You have something to offer. We need your perspective. Continue mm -hmm. to engage. Continue yeah. to be a part of it. It's not about the equipment that you mm -hmm. have. I need you. To, yeah. I need you. I need you. I need you. Yes. The well, Scott Gleason is forever talking about that. And, and so yeah. he, you know, he he constantly continued to share the importance Courage. of me yeah. not giving up and me yeah. not leaving the community. Mm -hmm. And um, and then Mike passed away. Um. And, 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 you know, this person was so dedicated to the community. He had streamed the day before mm -hmm. when he was in the hospital. Wow. And then he passed away the next day. Right. Um, and there was a lot of interaction. And, you know, he told me, he said that um, he wanted to help me. He wanted to encourage me. Mm -hmm. And I never met him. That's right. But. You but know him virtually, it, it, yes. But it, but he's but a it person all, in your head. He's a fully formed person in your mind, right? It, you it, know it, much it hurt. About him. Yeah. It hurt. It hurt yeah. Dave when yeah. he when he died, and I mourned him. 
And so I understand when you when you talk about this person that you never met that you engaged with for 30 years. Yeah. Now I didn't have that long a time with him, but um the connection it, was it, solid. Yeah. It it affected me. Mm. And um but and, that's what and there is are people... so wonderful about office hours is that it's a, an example of the project approach. People Absolutely. got together and had to decide what do we want to do with this? And that, well, I'd like to explore this. Well, I'd like to learn more about uh, uh, OSB or what, you know, and, and so then people went, well, I know about that and I can, I can check and look what I'll do a little demo for it. And this kind of thing is like us in a classroom of seven year olds, just sharing what we know and answering people's questions and bringing in people who actually are part of the industry and that and can give us insight into how both we can be better at what we do, but how we can understand what, what's going on in the world better. There are only two things that, of course, office hours doesn't allow, and that's politics and religion, uh, but in the sense that you can't favor one contractor over another and that sort of stuff. But I look at it as a media experiment, and we're building a whole new form of media just now. And the pandemic switched on the lights and said, there's another way to do this, and it's starting to catch. It takes a long time for a cultural change to happen, but it builds up over time and then it falls over and there it is. The old way of doing things falls over and what's behind it was all this effort to try and get a new way going and now it has the momentum and carries on. And that's happened with all media. All me uh, There's a book I keep handy right here, The Lost Tetrads of Marshall McLuhan. Um, Marshall McLuhan invented a method of predicting the effects of media and uh, it came up as a, a four-part tetrad. You usually see these as uh, 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 benefits, disadvantages, um, progress, uh, risks. What's the one? No, I can't remember it now. And he would group things into four quadrants and show you how any new technology or media is going to advance this, it's going to obsolete that, it's going to reclaim something from antiquity, and then it's going mm. to accelerate something else to what he called a flip, where it just sort of becomes a whole new thing. And I've been looking at Zoom and saying, the widespread of adoption of Zoom is mysterious, uh, not just because it was easy, but one of the things Zoom solved that a very famous Canadian researcher discovered years ago when dealing with satellite transmissions of telephone calls is called shared information space. And he got a complaint from a woman who every Sunday would call her sister and they'd have a nice cry on the phone together. But since she was connecting by satellite, the delay and the echoes interrupted that emotional exchange. And he, mm. and he sat with his crew and he worked out with his engineers. How can we make that happen simultaneously? What do we do when they can hear each other in real time? And I think the guys at Zoom solved that problem. And people naturally, without even knowing about it, decided that's a, that is a better uh, approach to doing it than than what we saw with Skype in the years before and what we've seen with Cisco or Polycom or all the other formal conferencing systems, they rely on a business format that, that they can operate within the business hierarchy and the structure. This is a free for all system. You can do whatever you want with it. And then you saw people pick up their phone, walk around their house and show what's going on. And then, you know, now we have TikTok. They're, they're making up stuff and putting it on. Well, this is a whole new thing going on, and I've, I've been watching it build for years, and I've trained many, many people, hundreds of people in video conferencing, and uh, it's just starting to explode. All of it is, and I think Alex talks about this a lot, that we're just waiting for everybody else to catch up to what Office Hours is doing. And I support Office Hours big time, and I've only been watching it for like seven or eight months. I knew about it, but I didn't tune it in, because we all watch Alex on, on MacBreak. And uh, I didn't tune it in at first, but I wanted to see if it would survive. And then when I saw what was going on in my own area, I went to office hours and saw what these guys are doing is really important. Um, you can put that in an envelope, put it on the shelf, and in 20 years, somebody can open it and say, yes, you're right, it was very important, this thing office hours is doing. We have we have a couple of questions that we need to oh, address. Great. Um, I, 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 I I, I I wish we had more time. We're, we're, we only have about 15 minutes left. I wish I wish we had uh, 
had another booked two more time another with two you hours. I still have a cookie. <laughs> I have a cookie left for my conference cookie. So you can give me a question. Well, uh, before I, I do that, I do want to say that for those, particularly those who are listening on the radio, what Office Hours is, it is a community of primarily video production um, developers, producers, directors, lighting, um, anything that's staging, radio, staging, lighting, radio, media professionals that came together. Yes. They came together during the, the pandemic and they were trying to figure out how they could do their work, even in the midst of the pandemic and being locked down and is led mm -hmm. by Alex Lindsay. And so what this group discovered was that they were able to galvanize themselves to come together and be able to solve problems that needed to be solved through mm -hmm. working together in the media realm. Mm -hmm. And they did a fantastic job of doing yeah. it. But I one of that. the byproducts of it was that they were able to um, create a community that was broader than their initial um, drive. They were interested in doing things that were video production related, mm -hmm. but it involved in, evolved into a community of people who were able to get past race, politics, and religion to come mm -hmm. together to be able to engage and interact with one another. Mm -hmm. And they are doing fantastic things. It is a 24 hour event that takes place every day. Recently, I think September 10th, was every nine, in the globe. I think September 10th yeah. represented 900 100. consecutive episodes of continuous office hours daily, continuous, continuous daily, every day of the week. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and one of the unique things about uh, office hours is that you can participate, go to officehours.global. You don't have to be, and an you can, you can participate yeah. and see what's going on. There's cutting edge technology that's being shared. Uh, Dave was a part of, and I don't think we're going to get to it. Dave was a part of the international broadcasting conference in Norway. Is that right? In Amsterdam. In Amsterdam. In Netherlands. Yeah. It was, and it was an that. amazing, <laughs> amazing, amazing mm -hmm. opportunity. Yeah. Um, and, and there's cutting edge technology you can glean by coming, watching, listening. Office hours is two hours. Uh, 10, it's going to improve your home movies. I can tell you that. Standard. If, you're, if you're making home movies with a Handycam, it's going to make your home movies so much better. It, 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 it's, 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 it has helped me in my work with Conversation with Tony Mobley and with and the only reason that Conversation with Tony Mobley exists is because of office hours. And, and, and the friendships and, and, and the support that I've gotten from the community. And yeah. I have people that are working on the back end of this conversation that are supporting yeah. me. Um, and that is how this is all possible. Then the conversation with Tony Moldy is not the only uh, event or project that is being produced through office hours. There are a lot more. Mm -hmm. Dave is going to be participating in a conversation on Saturday for educators. I encourage you to check it out. On Saturday, it's going to be 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, which is part of the second hour of office hours. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to I'm, I'm trying to talk fast and try to get all of this in. And so the, we have a question, question from Zachary Sorensen. And this mm -hmm. question is having a brother with a disability. Mm -hmm. How have you how has that helped you have better understanding of life? And I think that that was part of the reason he asked the question was, I had a question about your work with uh, PBS mm -hmm. and and the, the things that you did with that. So yeah, that, that was a hard yeah. That, you and I had that conversation uh, you know a month ago, I think, and uh, yeah, I was explaining to you what I did as a documentary on, on counseling for disabled people and and what happens to uh, young people get a lot of support as as uh, disabled people, but when they turn eighteen, they're almost let loose, and there's not a lot of support after that. There's a lot of um, problems with socializing and all the rest with with disabled people 
uh, having a, a brother who um, was physically obviously disabled and uh, was uh, separated in class and had to have special assistance to do things in class and stuff. Uh, it sensitized me and it, as my wife has described it, it's given me radar and I can see other disabled people instantaneously. I can see people who are probably on drugs or having trouble because I see their activities and their behavior as, as being, I, I can only put it as inconsistent, but there's a way people walk when they're normal let me say normal. Uh, there's a way people walk with confidence. There's a way people walk with un uncertainty. Uh, we see people who walk who have an ankle injury. It's a little different than a hip injury, which is a little different than a rib injury. And people change how they move. And with a disabled person, it's, it's obvious they're compensating physically for something that is disabling them. Now, sometimes it's obvious they're on crutches, for goodness sake. So in other ways, people are uh, mentally disabled. And you can tell by how they address things or how they look at things and the way they observe the world. Um, they're not like a cop who comes into a donut shop and surveys the whole room before he comes in because he needs to. That's his professional job. It's people who are hesitant and nervous and difficult. Uh, they find it difficult and then they have to have extra activity or behaviors that, that help them overcome those disabilities. And I've been able to work with the disabled. In fact, <laughs> going back to my cable days, one of the groups I had to deal with was a group of disabled adults who wanted to do a TV show about themselves. And the uh, guy running it is a famous Edmontonian now. And uh, he wanted to direct, but he had CP and was in a wheelchair. In fact, his wheelchair was the, the ones that sort of way back, you know, they're almost horizontal. And he wanted to switch the show. And his hand would not move very steadily. And I had to say, okay, you think you can do this? Okay, give it a try. And it was like Dave is sweating bullets that he's not going to hit the right button and it's all going to be a mess. And he, he directed the whole show. <laughs> and you could hardly understand him, but he was able to get everything going and switch. His fingers hit the right buttons every single time. And Cam is now you know, a legend in the city, but he, he was a forefront of people who are disabled can do normal things. And it's just, you have to accept them. You can adjust for their behavior or for their needs, but there's there's no real difference. And that's you know that's like me on a soapbox. But to answer the person's question, yeah, it has helped me in my life to be able to see people who are either in despair, dis troubled, uh, in difficulty, and be able to walk right up and be unafraid. And I I think it's important for me to share with you that the person who asked the question, uh, Zachary Sorensen is uh, a person who has he is a person with a disability mm -hmm. and has he, he been on after hours he has been on after yeah hours. i think and i've seen he, zachary yes i've seen him yeah and he he is also mm -hmm. managing or has managed the youtube chat for um conversation with tony mobley there you go yeah and he does he does a fantastic job of mm -hmm. doing that no i've seen zachary yeah yeah that's yeah. great and and so um plus two for we, zachary yes yeah thank thank you zachary for the great question yeah. give me another and one. and and so the what's showing to me right now is our very last question okay <laughs> but i don't want to ask our last question yet <laughs> come on but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I do down wanna, there, Tony. Bear I, down on. I I do want to ask you about. Um, yeah, you know, we have so many great questions that. that so um, uh, let's let's talk about your your um your work at the University of Alberta. Sure. Um, I I came out of that milieu for nine years. I did this community thing with people who didn't know anything about television, and. Uh, one day a friend of mine uh, said, you know, I'm reading in this uh, staff newspaper at the university that they're looking for a TV producer. You, you should go try this. And I said, yeah, well, maybe I will. And I walked in on a guy who I had consulted with years before about making laser discs. He was the world's expert in laser discs at the time. And uh, I had been trying to do a business where you would create content for laser disc and program it to be interactive and all that stuff. 
and I went to him and I met with him and, and sort of took a whole bunch of notes. He said, well, you got to do it this way and you got in 3M print the disks and here's how, and he informed me and educated me and, and that business didn't go. So I, of course, had to go work for a living again. And then there was this opportunity at the university. And I came in and it was only about 20 minutes into our interview that he realized he'd already spoken to me years before and that he understood what I was what I was capable of doing and wanted me to, to take the job. And the, it's the only interview I've been in that lasted 90 minutes. So we had such mm -hmm. a wonderful time. And I knew I had the job when they started touring me around and showing me everything. Usually they don't walk you through the factory and say, you know, this is where you might work. No, they walk you through the factory because they want you to know what you're going to be doing. So um, I had uh, totally revamped their system. I got uh, productivity out of the thing. And I had a whole system because I was a producer already of helping professors who don't know anything about TV understand how to get their ideas across in video or interactive media. So we made DVDs, we made uh, uh, interactive CD-ROMs, and we also made a lot of video clips. So they would come to me in a meeting and uh, we'd be introduced, this is Dave the producer, all you have to do is give him what it is you think you want to use in your classroom and he'll work out a way to make it. And the guy would say, well, I'd like the complete history of the Ukrainian people in Alberta in eight minutes to start my lecture off at the beginning of the term. And I said, oh, okay, well, we can do that. And he would provide me with all the material and the pictures and all the historical stuff. And we'd create a narrative together and work out a script and, and have either on-camera hosting or, or we go out in the field and show some of the older buildings and all that stuff. And then we'd assemble this thing together and he'd show it in class. And this taught me that when you do that kind of stuff, you're locking it in concrete. You can't change it after you've made a video of it. You have to your your curriculum then is locked and you can't make a change and so interactive intrigued me so much more uh, because the choice you make at step one ch affects this choice you make at step eight and so you're branching out from one step to the next and it gets really complicated but you're following a path that's unique to your needs and what you learn like and and it can re-guide you back to the main subject but you can also have divergences and this sort of uh, interactive media really caught my attention. So I did nine years with that operation and uh, made quite a, we got a few awards as well, but yeah, we, we made a whole ton of stuff and uh, now the department isn't there. So, oh, well. Oh, wow. Well, mm -hmm. well, thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> um, wow, Dave. It has been cool. Um, yeah, so we're, we're down to the last question. All right. And the last question is, you're speaking to the world, what do you want them to know? Um, all media are environments. When you engage with a medium, you're putting yourself in that environment. Think of a car. Uh, a car is a medium, medium of transportation. And it gets you from A to B, but it's also a mobile couch where you get to relax and just enjoy the ride as well as drive. And you can have radio or music. And now you, of course, you can play video games in the back seat. But it's an environment around you. And if you think of everything, television, books, uh, radio, movies, they're environmentals. Uh, and, and we place ourselves in them. And we change who we are when we enter that room or we go into that car. Uh, road rage is, a, is a, a secondary effect of people who are frustrated with other drivers and they act it out with their car. Um, but any medium you're doing uh, or engaging with is going to have an effect on you. And uh, the thing to remember at the beginning of that whole process, and this is something I've taught parents uh, about video games and about too much TV or reading comic books, uh, if a kid is doing something for eight hours a day to the exclusion of anything else, it's, it's going to be harmful. But there's no harm in being involved with a medium. It's the personality that is outside that engagement that has to be dealt with. So I tell people that when I describe this environment factor in, in media, is to be aware of that, in, investigate it, and be aware of how it is changing you. What was different about your life before Zoom and what's different about your life after Zoom is an incredible investigation because it tells you something about yourself and other people 
And then you can have sympathy and compassion for other people who are not coping because the world is too complex for them and they're not having enough time to investigate. And if we can just get the world to, McLuhan wanted to slow everything right down. He didn't like this accelerating thing, but mm -hmm. he always said, you can't be controlled by something that you seek to understand. And it is absolutely true. As long as you're still trying to understand it, it'll have no controlling factor on you. If you stop trying to understand it, then you are subjugated by it. And it becomes something that you, you're being controlled by. So that's my statement to the world. You can carve that one on my tombstone there. All media are environments. And the longer you investigate them, the more you'll understand about yourself. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation with you. Thank you. Well, so you've much, had the Dave same Tom. experience. This whole office hours thing has changed you, right? Yes, it has. Yes, yeah. indeed. And when has. you're doing office hours, you're in a mode. You, you, you've shut all the doors. You're, you're in the in that environment. You're with that community. That, as Alex call it, that intentional community, and that's a great thing. But I'm happy you Absolutely. decided to want to talk to little old Dave here in Edmonton, uh, because I never I, get to talk about this stuff anymore because I don't teach well, anymore. Well, I, the fact is that uh, I, I know that there are going to be people that are going to be tuning in on Saturday based on the mm. conversation that we've had tonight. So yeah. again, thank you so much. This has been You're a busy welcome. day. I, and one of the things that I wanted to, 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 to ask you, it wasn't yeah. one of the questions, but how was it to be your first time on as a panel. panel member on office yeah. hours. Yeah. Um, it was nervous right up to showtime. Uh, but as you know, I've done a lot of live television, uh, tons of it. And going live, if you don't have butterflies, uh, singers will tell you the same thing. Nana Muscuri said the same thing to me. Uh, you're standing backstage, you have butterflies. You're nervous every time. If you're not nervous, you should get out of the game. Uh, and that is the same for me. I, I uh, tell my wife that if I know I'm going to have a good day in production if I have a disaster dream the night before. If nothing works in my dream the night before, everybody is running scattered and nobody will pay attention. This thing is not working. That's failing. Everything's. If I have a dream about it the night before, my productions the next day are flawless. And so I did have the necessary disaster dream last night, and uh, everything went very smoothly today, including Fantastic. this. Including this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. All right. Thank you so much. You have a good special night. thanks. Special thanks to Kimberly Mobley, Ron Mobley, Global Family and Friends, Alex Lindsay, Office Hour Members, DVE Store, Liminal Entertainment Technologies, Bite Hive, VDO360.com, ApprovedForLoan.com, Cloud Bedrock LLC, Ken Jordan, Jonas Detail, Aaron Huslish, Cherik Cheetah, David Brady, Marcus Lee Folk, Richard Lavery, Chris Finlet, Manolo Lozano, Jeffrey Powers, Bo Cordo. Mickey Makachura, Hasma, Guy Jard, Doug Mola, Laura Thompson, Brian Chan, Dennis Champion Walker, Roscoe Jones, George Butters, Joshua Menden, Daniel Maxwell, Taylor Sunderhouse, Adrian Albeck, Michael Marr, Zachary Sorensen, Conversation with Tony Mobley, producer, Plylock, Miguel Lopez Waterman. Mm -hmm. When you have time, please go back and look at the 60 plus episodes of Conversation with Tony Mobley. I think you will find something that you like and hopefully is helpful. Thank you all so much for tonight. Thank you, Z98.1 FM, our audience in Cincinnati that can also be heard in TuneIn Radio and the internet. Thank you, Taylor Sunderhouse, team behind Conversation with Tony Mobley. Thank you. Dave Troutman, so much for our conversation tonight. Two thumbs next up to week, the crew backstage. Yes, that's right. Next week, we are going to have Mr. Richard Lavery. And that's right. He will be on next week. And some of you may not know who he is, but I guarantee if you tune in next week, you will be happy that you did. And he will be my guest next week. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. If you like Conversation with Tony Mobley, please like and subscribe on YouTube and feel free to visit our website, 
conversationwithtonymobley.com. Take care and good night. Thanks so much.